According to a new survey out today, one of four physicians knows a doctor that has taken his or her own life. Across the country, our doctors are jumping from hospital rooftops, overdosing in call rooms, found hanging in hospital chapels. She was worried that she would lose her medical license or be ostracized by her colleagues because she was suffering burnout. Experts say this was a public health crisis long before COVID-19 and the pandemic has only worked to heighten the issue. So the mental health crisis in America and medicine is very serious. There's a high rate of burnout in our physician population. 300 to 400 physicians die by suicide every year. So yes, we ha are having a mental health crisis, not just with the general population, but also here in medicine with our healthcare workers and more specifically physicians. How bad is the situation of mental health with physicians? I think that, you know, it's been bad and COVID has just unmasked how bad it is, right? I think it's been, it's been a struggle for years. Um, I wanna share that when I was a resident, one of my seniors committed suicide and it was devastating for all of us. And it was devastating because it seemed like he really had it all together. And I think that's the thing that's striking about physicians, that we can hold it all together when privately we're suffering so much. And it's almost like, I wish someone had, you know, I wish we knew, I wish he had reached out. I wish we understood how deep the struggles were. signs and symptoms that you can pay attention to to recognize with yourself and with others um, that might lead us to think that someone might be suffering or struggling. So the changes or the signs and symptoms you might see might fall under a behavioral change, um, mood change, or things that are said or ways that are being expressed. So for example, when we look at behavior changes, you want to pay attention to any uncharacteristically different behaviors that are being presented. So sometimes it might look like being late to clinic, not showing up on time. It can also be emotional outbursts. Oftentimes we look at, we can see it as like anger outbursts. Um, sometimes it can be crying, um, unexpected crying, you're at work. If you are withdrawing uh, from your social support system, you're withdrawing from your colleagues, from your workforce, um, all of this suggests that you might be struggling or you may be having some of these challenges, things that you normally don't experience on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, when we look at mood, sometimes it's the ab abrupt mood change. So one day you are feeling miserable, down, can't get out of bed, the next day you're feeling anxious or really just up and you know can't go to sleep, those significant mood changes, um, irritability, sometimes feeling a little bit more hopeless. Um, and then sometimes we also have sort of this like detachment where you're no longer feeling, you know, as physicians that compassion. So you're experiencing some compassion fatigue and noticing that you just kind of want to get through the day and just end and go home or, or just not want to show up to work, that feeling of dread. Some of the things that, you know, we may say or that is expressed that kind of indicate that there's something going on. Um, you know, oftentimes we see individuals who are thinking about suicide may start talking a lot about death and dying. So paying attention to that. Um, again, expressing hopelessness uh, or wishing that they weren't alive or could disappear. Those are all indicators that, um, you know, someone is struggling. Seeking a safe space to talk about uh, one's uh, mental health challenges or concerns is extremely important. I think that first starts with actually making sure that the culture is acceptable and uh, compassionate uh, about 
you know, these uh, sorts of issues and concerns. By designing each individual who's participating and listening in those safe spaces, have um, an understanding that what is exchanged, what is actually shared is completely confidential and that they're not to share that with anyone. That's the professional expectation of that. Particularly our GME psychologist who works for me um, doesn't even tell me uh, anything uh, at, at all uh, in terms of details or identities of individuals who've come to her. So uh, the confidentiality uh, and the safety of these spaces is our highest priority uh, to ensure that people feel comfortable seeking these spaces out. Um, so I, I would say that I'm probably the, uh, particularly for residents, I'm, I'm probably the highest risk individual of knowing anything beyond uh, that safe space. And I can assure you that Dr. Abu Zayab tells me nothing. Uh, so there are a few reasons why physicians shy away from asking for help. Um, stigma and shame are probably the two biggest reasons. Uh, this, you know, worry of not wanting to show that they are weak um, or incapable. Um, we know that physicians are very resilient um, and we also know that there's a high rate of burnout and so you, those two can coexist, resiliency and burnout and depression and anxiety. You know, I think part of it is, is that there's this, sto you have to be stoic in medicine, right? Don't they teach you? And I think we've all learned that, you know, it's about the patient, it's not about you, right? And you have to be delivered difficult news and you can't put your own feelings, right? That's kind of what you get taught. And so before you know it, you almost put these walls constantly and you don't assess like, how is this, how is this making me feel and affecting me? The issue of physician mental health is so stigmatized primarily because most physicians join into what we call a social contract uh, with um, society. Uh, what is that social contract? The social contract is that as a physician, you have a higher calling and you have a higher calling to do whatever it takes to keep patients, the population, and society healthy uh, to cure them. Uh, and this is really important because that sets medicine aside from every other field. And it means that it becomes acceptable in the social contract for physicians to sacrifice themselves. Uh, and also for physicians to live up to an expectation, particularly associated with their competency, uh, that has no room for question or error. So with such a social contract in place, it's extremely difficult for physicians to admit that they need help, uh, for physicians to admit that something may be wrong. Uh, if a physician admits that they need help or that something's wrong, to the individual physician, it means that they may in fact uh, be giving a signal to others that they're not competent that they're not good enough, that they're not trustworthy, that they're not safe. And, you know, the stigma around accessing help is really, you know, part of it is the internalized shame, the looking weak, and then there's also this real fear of jeopardizing your work or, or your future career, um, not being licensed or getting your license revoked. And licensure with the medical board of any state uh, has a, a very low threshold for removing the privilege of practicing medicine for physicians who are deemed or believed to be incompetent. The fact that you've invested so much time and money in your career and this fear of losing it, right? You're scared that if someone finds out I'm, I have depression or I have this, you might take my license away. I might not be able to get a job. If I have to put it in on a form, whether I have depression or not, will they hire me? What will happen, right? And I think there's a lot of stigma around that. It's really hard for physicians to be honest about what they're going through and to get the help because they're scared about, well, what would happen next? What's gonna get taken? Is my career gonna get taken away? Is this gonna get taken away? And I think that that's really difficult.
you know, I know there are advocacy groups that are fighting against sort of the medical board and other credentialing committees to try to change those questions that might tap into mental health history or your current mental health state. So I think that there are a number of barriers and those barriers are the social contract that we're set up with even in entering the field, but then it's the expectations that uh, we put on ourselves uh, that are um, unfortunately difficult to negotiate with because we end up um, basically saying we can't let anyone down or ourselves down. And then there are the other barriers to seeking help, um, which include um, not enough time, right? So working a lot and feeling really guilty to take time off to attend sessions. Uh, we have sort of this real crisis or issue happening now where um, mental health demand is really high. So a lot of providers have wait lists, so it's taking a lot of time to get help. Insurance companies aren't always providing updated provider lists. Um, so all of these get in the way of accessing help. Um, and then another one too is just, you know, when you're in training or you're working, there is this fear of asking for time off because, you know, again, it's the perception, the stigma, the shame, but then it's also, I don't want to burden my colleagues if I have to step away. And this is where I think as an institution, we have to put protective measures. Dr. Lorna Breen exemplified all of the best qualities of a physician, but she found herself overwhelmed by the COVID crisis, even contracting the virus herself while serving as head of a New York City hospital emergency department. She was a very driven physician. She contracted the virus herself and tried to recover at home. When she didn't have a fever for 24 hours, she called and went back to work. She was scheduled for 10, 12 hour shifts in a row. But she wasn't working 12 hours, she's working 15 hours and 18 hours. Uh, patients dying in the waiting room where their portable oxygen would just expire and not enough beds, not enough help. She called us and said, this is gonna end my career. My colleagues are gonna be able to recognize that I can't keep up. And we said, then you should go home. But, but she didn't because she was a dedicated physician just like so many healthcare workers. Only a handful of days later, she called Jennifer and was basically in a catatonic state. She couldn't get out of her chair. At that point, we solicited the help of some of some of her childhood friends and her medical school friends to get her physically out of Manhattan. Lorna was in really rough shape. So Jennifer, she drove her big sister to the hospital. Like you do. Lorna spent 10 days in the hospital, her first ever mental health treatment. And only a day or two into that mental health treatment, she started to call home and say, now that I've gotten help, it's gonna ruin my career. I'm gonna lose my license to practice medicine. And we thought, how could that be possible in this day and age? Unfortunately, that fear of basically her career being over was one of the things that we believe contributed to her decision to take her own life. And when Lorna became so overworked and despondent that she was unable to move, do you know what she was worried about? Her job. She was worried that she would lose her medical license or be ostracized by her colleagues because she was suffering burnout due to her work on the front lines of the COVID-19 crisis. She was afraid to get help. There are a tremendous amount of resources here at Harbor UCLA Medical Center for our resident physicians, as well as our attendings to seek help um, when there are questions or concerns about their well-being. Um, they include, uh, first and foremost, the environment, each other. Um, I think we have a, a, a very close-knit family as a um, level one trauma center uh, in the public health system uh, that actually is small enough where people get to know each other, develop relationships. So I think our first resource primarily is each other. Um, and, and that's, I think, really, really important. Uh, and that is across disciplines. So that includes, you know, if you're a physician, other physicians in other departments, it includes nurses, it includes other members of the staff and your attendings. So I would say that that's um, the first and actually a pretty prevalent resource. There are a variety of formal resources. Um, we are very fortunate to have a 
psychologist that we hired a few years ago, uh, Dr. Holda Abuziab. I provide free confidential services uh, for residents and fellows and their therapy services. And you can just give me a call or email me or come to my office and we can get that scheduled. Um, and it's confidential and, and private, so it's totally separate and no one really needs to know that you're accessing therapy through that. Oftentimes, um, you know, it's short term, so it can be, it can address whatever the um, onset of the problem is, or, you know, if you're looking for more longer term therapy, it's a great way to bridge you while you're waiting to get access. Uh, then we also have uh, the Physician Wellbeing Committee that is a resource and support committee that's made up of different disciplines. I mean, and it's actually for all providers in the hospital. And usually um, people will refer individuals, whether it's self-referral or from a colleague, to the Physician Wellbeing Committee if they're seeing someone struggling or if they're having challenges of professionalism or whatever it is that might be connected to mental health issues. And there, um, a, um, a member will meet with that faculty or that physician or that provider and then discuss resources and referrals as well. And then we also have this peer emotional support program at Harbor and it's called Helping Healers Heal H3. H3 is actually shortened for Helping Healers Heal and it's a peer support program. And the whole purpose around the peer support program was really to support each other as healthcare workers when we're going through a difficult time because of an adverse event or because some kind of patient event, patient related event. And really the impetus of this came from uh, a physician who wrote an op-ed piece in a journal, a medical journal, talking about the second victim, right? The first victim was obviously the patient, but the second victim was the provider who, after there was an adverse event, really got traumatized by the experience. A lot of times when we go take care of patients, they're very sick, it's high risk, and a lot of times the decisions that we make really have life impacting, uh, really impacts the patient's life in a major way and the family. And, and those consequences also affect us, right? We internalize that. And so the peer support program is to then reach out to those individuals and to almost normalize the experience to say, hey, you made a mistake and it affected a patient. I know about that because I've gone through that as well. And really normalize and talk about it and help the provider so they're in a headspace where they can go back and take continue taking care of patients. On the intranet, there's a link for H3 Helping Healers Heal, and you can click on it and ask, you know, for support for someone else, a colleague, or maybe your team, or for yourself. And what we do is we actually meet with you and decide, you know, after we've had one interaction, we decide, does this person need a follow-up? Do I just need to give them a text or a call just to check in with them later? And we ask you, hey, do you want us to check in? Or do we feel that there's actually a mental health issue or crisis that we need to escalate, right? And so that's when then we provide actual resources where um, we work with you to find a psychiatrist or a therapist. The thing that's really important is that these sessions are uh, confidential, right? And I think that that's really important for us to allow people to know that this is a safe space. Whatever you tell me is gonna stay here unless it becomes a crisis. And then we don't, we, we escalate it in terms of like uh, finding the right support. And then, of course, in the county, we have the Employee Assistant Program, EAP, that uh, allows you to have mental health sessions with a trained mental health counselor. And that's also something very separate from GME and even separate from Harbor. It's through, through DHS. Those are sort of the big resources we have. Um, the Resident Wellbeing Committee that we have here for residents and fellows, again, is also more a support and resources. So if you're having question, questions around what we have here at Harbor, you can even reach out to the Resident Wellbeing Committee uh, for more information and resources. The National Suicide Prevention Hotline, uh, which was 1-800-273-TALK, is now a three-digit uh, number, 988. 
And what it is, is it's for any mental health issue or crisis, or, you know, what I like to say, if you're having um, a really distressing moment and you need to talk to someone, then you can call 988 and they will redirect you to a confidential trained mental health counselor. Um, and then DMH also has a well-being line for county employees that you can access. Um, at Harbor, we also have a resource page that offers more resources like on demand, whether they're videos or mindfulness audios and, and progressive muscle relaxation that you can access. Um, and it's called the Coping with COVID resource page that we developed early on in the pandemic that we are continually updating with well-being resources. No medical school wants to be known as the suicide school. No hospital wants to be number one for interns jumping from rooftops. No one wants to become a doctor to kill themselves. It's the ultimate oxymoron, the barefoot shoemaker, the starving chef, the suicidal doctor. So why? What the hell is going on? And why is it such a secret? And why am I piecing this together between patients? I'm a solo family doc, yet somehow I've become an investigative reporter, a specialist in physician suicide. Why? Hi. Hi, Dr. Weibel. How are you? Good, how are you? Doing well. This is so great. Thank you. Thank you for uh, making this time. Thank you for having this small conversation with me regarding physician mental health and um, this ongoing epidemic on physician suicide. No problem. I'm excited to share whatever I've learned over the past 10 plus years. So I just wanted to bring to you a, a, a question that I had and, and I think many physicians also um, have is that should we physicians be afraid of um, and not seek help when clearly there is this stigma and uh, potential risk to uh, medical licensure and uh, potentially our careers. Physicians should all be getting mental health care. It should be a requirement of the profession. But what is essential is that we choose our own healthcare team and we do not wait until we have developed such maladaptive behavior that we're mandated into therapy by our employer or the state medical board because that's not gonna work as well. In your experience and research, what path um, has this led for uh, physicians who um, ultimately have not sought help? Those who have not sought help, well, I have about 2,000 obituaries of physicians, unfortunately, that I've collected and reviewed and analyzed where they've gone wrong, and most of them have not asked for help. And if they have asked for help, they've maybe gone the wrong route or been mandated to seek help from a service that is not really helpful. As you know, a lot of mental health care, if it's mandated, can be more punishment-oriented towards physicians. So punishment is not healthcare. And I believe in order to have that therapeutic alliance, you need to want to seek health care and to select somebody who you resonate with that's going to serve you in the best way, because not everyone needs the same sort of healing strategy. It's really important when you select your own mental health team that it not be on an electronic medical record. As, po as far as possible, you should ask the psychiatrist or therapist, MSW, the trauma, you know, informed therapist, whomever you choose, is this truly a confidential visit between the two of us? Do you keep a medical record? You know, these are all things that I think would help people feel more comfortable revealing the depth of their psychological pain mm -hmm. with basically a stranger who can turn into a comrade in your healing if that trust exists. Great, thank you very much. I guess, would you like to uh, say a message to our wonderful and hardworking providers at the Harbor UCLA Medical Center regarding physician suicide awareness? To all the wonderful health professionals at Harbor UCLA Medical Center, I really wanna thank you for the service that you're providing in a very difficult time amid pandemic issues, amid social infrastructure failing. I mean, you have been our social safety net and in order for you all to help us 
as citizens in this country, you deserve to receive mental health care yourself. And that mental health care should be confidential and non-punitive. And I want to encourage you to get that wherever you find it. And there, there are amazing therapists out here. I even have free trauma recovery support groups. Um, I'm sure you have other things locally, even within your medical center. And I want to encourage you to try all of them. Don't be closed-minded. Try every avenue of healing. And then it's just kind of like dating. You don't end up marrying everyone you go on a date with, but it's worth going on a lot of dates so that you can see what works for you. Okay. And some people have told me they don't want to go to employer sponsored mental health services because they're not sure they can release the full fury of their feelings when they're next to the dean's office or their employer, right? Some people, they find employer based wellness uh, really helpful and convenient and it works well for them. So I don't want you to close your mind to any one healing option, but rather explore as many as possible. Great, thank you. I love the um, I love the dating analogy. I I actually need to just go on more dates <laughs> myself as well. Yeah. Um, a time to go on dates, but it's yeah. it's good. There's also another analogy that I think people would find helpful is the dental health analogy. You don't just wait until you have an abscess and you need three implants. You actually floss and brush on a daily or regular basis. You go see proactively a dentist maybe every six months. And so mental health should be treated the same as dental health in a proactive daily routine that works for you. That could just be journaling is really good. Uh, so that you're not carrying with you the dead child or the adverse reaction you witnessed having to do with a patient. You know, like you can get it out of your system before you go to bed instead of drinking alcohol, much better. Um, also, you might try meditation. There's so many different ways that you can calm yourself and um, choose different ways of servicing your own mental health so that you stay ahead of the pain and you're not in a chronic state of grieving or in trauma. Another really handy way to look at this is there's a button that I saw once that said emotional baggage limited to two carry-ons. Mm -hmm. Just do a self-assessment and see most physicians probably have three semi-trucks of emotional baggage behind them. And it would be really good to start unpacking that because it sneaks up on you and can cause you major mental health problems when people sort of snap. It's not usually that you're snapping. It's just that you've got three, you've got a triple semi behind you of trauma. And it's good to let it go at intervals every day, kind of like the dental flossing. You are smart. You are loved. You have, and this is for everyone out there at UCLA and everywhere, you are intelligent, amazing people, and you have so many options for your life. Please do not circle in a you know career cul-de-sac and feel stuck you, you should never feel like you're in a dead-end job you have many many options and I am happy to talk to anyone who needs help and inspiration thank you for that message um, so um, yeah thank you for all that you do I think um, you're probably the most well-known and influential person advocating for physician mental health in the United States right now um, so it's like I'm meeting a celebrity and you're in my little film. How cool is that? You'll be one of the first ones to receive a link to the video once I complete it. <laughs> so, all right. Okay. All right. Thank you. Have a nice day, Dr. Bible. Bye bye. No more talking about it The way it is, the way it is It's no mystery There's no getting around it When you're here, when you're here We got chemistry We light up when we ignite When you leave, 
I think the first thing you need to recognize is that you're not alone. Don't forget to uh, That many before you, many currently with you, and for some time in the future, uh, many will continue to struggle with mental health challenges. This work that we do is really hard. Uh, so first recognize that you're not alone. I totally recognize how hard it is to go through struggles, personal, emotional, mental struggles, and do it alone. And you're not alone. We're actually here. We've gone through them. We've struggled just the way you're struggling. And when you reach out, we're here with open arms waiting to listen and to help you through it all because we want you to thrive. We are here for you. We are here with you. If you're questioning whether you are having a hard time or questioning whether you need therapy, please reach out. One of the most compassionate things that you can do for yourself, for your colleagues, for your patients, and for your loved ones is to take care of yourself and ask for help because you matter. When